getting out of winter. Yeah, they're working on it. That's why I'm, I'm vamping right now. It's uh, going to make sure my levels are right. I can hear you now. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Sal Pizarro, your president. I'd like to welcome you to the 5,385th meeting of the Rotary Club of San Jose. I apologize if you're having trouble hearing me either in the room or on Zoom. We're working on it. I think ever since I, I gave you your team uh, your dirt a couple weeks ago, they've been uh, they've been kind of super high. But they, they work with me now and then now. So I'd like to welcome everybody and thank the Hank House Impact Committee for bringing us in the lobby. We'll be hearing from Laura a little bit later about her committee. Hello. There we go. Okay. Hi, President Sal. I'm Bunny Layden. I'm a technology consultant, and my sponsors are Dick Connick and James Gordon. Hello. Oh, thanks for Okay. Hello, uh, Mr. President. This is Sharad. And I run a small real estate brokerage here in Santa Clara. And my sponsor is Sarah Klitsch. Wonderful. Great to have you, Sharad. Okay. If visiting Rotarians or Rotarians are guests, can please stand so we can get you introduced. Okay, President Sal. I'm going to start over here because I have the mic. And this is my friend Larry, who's a former facilities manager for Couchbase. Wonderful. Thank you. Great to have you here. President Sal, I am very pleased to introduce you to my uh, formal piano instructor, friend, and musical mentor, Mr. Joel Kassoff. Welcome. Welcome to our club. Tom. Mr. President, I want to introduce uh, as Vic's guest, uh, my buddy for the last 50 years, Lorel Bondi. <laughs> to have you here. Arthur. Hi, President Sal. Uh, I'm happy to introduce my executive assistant at Lincoln Law School, Veronica Zia. Great. Thank you for coming. Hi, President Sal. Deanna Persai. I have two guests here. We have Lynette Jezik, who is a certified compassion trainer in considering joining Rotary. And we have Ashe Ilame, and he oh. is was a state rotor actor and the new treasurer to the rotor act club well, congratulations and thank you for coming today hello president sal i have my uh good friend johnny camus here former city hello. from uh, district 10. johnny good to see you again and i think we got one up here up front we're, we're getting it to you i was gonna say why don't i just shout <sighs> um barbara marshman and my usual guest will marshman Always good to see you, Will. Any more guests to introduce at this time? Seeing none, we will move on to one of our favorite parts of the day, which is a entertainment. Uh, sorry, I don't have a slide for that. I was confused by my slides. But let me welcome up James Williams to introduce our entertainment today. James. Thank you. Thank you, President Sal, for inviting Opera San Jose to our meeting today. I am so pleased that these three incredible artists have taken time out of their busy schedule to be with us today. Uh, all three are currently in our final rehearsals for Tosca, the beloved Italian opera, personally my favorite opera of all, which opens in a week uh, at the California Theater and runs for three weekends. So I am going to do one introduction of everyone and then we'll let the artists come up separately. So today we have uh, Maria Natali. She is the star of Tosca playing the role of Floria Tosca. She has been praised by the New York Times for her penetrating voice and won several prestigious national vocal competitions. And I'm so happy that she 
would take time out of our rehearsal schedule to come here today. She's going to be performing the most famous aria from Tosca, Vite d'Arte, which is really about she's living for love of art and beauty before she has to give herself over to the villain. Yes, it's a very exciting plot. But first up and a little more lighthearted, uh, we have bass baritone Joshua Hughes, who national reviewers have praised for his vocal range and his lush voice. He recently starred in a Gilbert and Sullivan operata in San Francisco and will sing an English language song from that today for us. And of course, most importantly, we have Miss Veronica Agronoff Defoe, the incredibly talented pianist for opera films. So thank you and welcome Joshua to the stage. <laughs> robs me of my rest. Love, hope, this love, my ardent soul encumbers. Love, night may like, lies heavy on my chest. And weaves itself into my midnight slumber. Headache, no repose is taboo by anxiety. I conceive you may use any language you choose to indulge in without impropriety. For your brain is on fire, the bedclothes conspire. Of usual allow to flood you. First your counterpane goes and uncovers your toes, and your sheet slips demurely from under you. Then the blanketing tickles, you feel like mixed pickles, so terribly sharp as a pricking. And your heart and you cross and you tumble and toss to this number tricks you and the ticking. Then the bedclothes are creep to the ground in a heap, and you pick them all up in a table. Next your pillow resigns and politely declines to remain at its usual angle. Well, you get to repose in the form of a dose with hot eyeballs and head of an aching, but your slumbering teens are such horrible dreams that you'd very much better be waking. Well, you dream you're all crossing the channel and tossing a mountainous steamer from Hedditch, which is something between a large bathing machine and a very small second-class Hedditch, and you're giving a treat to the icicle meat to a party of friends and relations. There are ravenous horde in the old human board at Times Square and South Kensington stations. And bound on that journey, you'll find your attorney who started that morning from Devon. He's a bit undersized, and you don't feel surprised when he tells you he's only 11. Where are you driving like mad with a singular lad by the by the ship's now a fourth wheeler? And you're playing around games, and he calls you bad names when you tell him that ties pay the dealer. But did you can't stand to throw up your hand, and you find you're as cold as an icicle. In your shirt and your socks, the black suit with gold box, stocking soles, spray plane, and a bicycle. And he and the crew are on bicycles too, which they some or other invested in. And he's telling the tars of the particulars of a company he is interested in. It's a scheme of devices to get at low prices of goods from cosmic to cables, which tickled the sailors by treating retailers as though they were all vegetables. You get a good statement to plot for trade and just take up his boots with the boot tree. And his legs to take root and his fingers are shoot and the blossom in bud like a fruit tree. From the green grocery tree you get grapes and green pea, cauliflower, pineapple and cranberries. For the pastry cook lunch, cherry brandy will run to apple puffs and three quarters and banberries. The shares are a penny and ever so many are taken in Roth, Charlie Manning. And just as a few are allotted to you, you awake with a shudder and despair. Crick in your neck, and no one you saw for your hands on the floor, and you've needles and pins from your soul's tissues, and you've to the crick for your legs asleep, and you clap and you toes, and you fly in your nose, it's a flop in your lung, and a feverish tongue, and a thirst is intense in a general sense, but you haven't been sleeping in clover. But the darkness has passed, and it's daylight at last, and the night has been long, ditto, ditto, my song, and thank goodness there both of them.
That was wonderful. Thank you so much to the three of you. And thank you, James, for bringing Opera San Jose back to us. Of course, as he mentioned, Tosca opens next weekend at the beautiful California Theater. I hope you can all make it. Next, we are going to have a new member introduction. So if I could have Gay Crawford bring up our newest Rotarian. Gay? Thomas Russell is the executive director of the Central YMCA in San Jose over here on the Alameda. Born and raised in the Seattle area, he majored in political science and minored in art history at the University of Washington. Yes. <laughs> Part-time job while at college was uh, doing lifeguarding at the downtown Seattle YMCA, and then he was promoted to aquatics director before relocating to San Jose, where he, he credits luck in getting him the current title of executive director. Thomas also serves as a commission member on the city of Campbell's Civic Improvement Commission and previously the city's Measure O Oversight Committee. He loves to travel and is very excited about traveling to Amsterdam in a few weeks for the fabulous Vermeer exhibit. Civic-minded, aquatic man, art aficionado, YMCA guy, <laughs> please welcome Thomas Russell, the newest member of the San Jose Rotary Club. Well, thank you everyone for the, uh, the warm introduction. I'll tell you that uh, the first time I ever learned of Rotary was when I was nine years old. I was in a movie theater watching Catch Me If You Can with my dad. And of course, for those of you who have seen the movie, you might know that the scene opens with Frank Abagnale Sr. receiving a Lifetime Achievement Award from his Rotary Club. And I sit, turned to my dad in the theater and said, what's the Rotary? And so after, he after the movie, he explained to me what it was. And uh, here we are 21 years later, and I'm now in a Rotary Club myself, so I think that's pretty neat. Um, I do want to say thanks to Gay, who's been an amazing sponsor. Um, and, you know, she told me all the things not to do up here today that would get me fined. So I appreciate that. And uh, also, some of you uh, may know Sarah Klish actually teaches at the Central YMCA. Um, so I, I've known Sarah for a while through the Y, and she's also been helpful in sort of talking me through Rotary and, and helping me think through how to best be engaged. And uh, you know, I'm really excited to be joining the club. I'm looking forward to meeting many of you. Uh, and, you know, I feel really passionate about the potential that downtown San Jose has. I think there's high potential and there's also a lot of need. So uh, I'm excited about working with everybody to uh, really, you know, improve the community. And um, a couple of things real quickly on a personal note. I do love to travel and I also love going on cruises. So if anyone has any cruise recommendations, please let me know. I just took a Viking cruise last year, which was awesome. And then lastly, I'm a big sports fan. So I do have to admit, I am a big Seahawks fan. So, and I, and I, and I wanted to, I got to give a shout out to Larry because Larry, you're probably not going to be the only one booed anymore. I think the Seahawks might be more unpopular here than taxes. So, uh, Thank you everyone for the welcome. I look forward to meeting all of you. We are looking forward to working with you too, Thomas. Even though you're a Seahawks fan, I don't have a problem with that. Larry doesn't have a problem with that. The rest of you can learn to live with it. Okay, up next, we're gonna have Douglas Smith come up and talk to us about fun and friendship stuff. Firesides and uh, another fun golf event coming up, I believe. So Thomas, welcome, but I do want to let you know you can be fined for not attending the, the fun and friendship events. Um, so we have coming up on uh, March 22nd, the, uh, I'm sorry, April 22nd, our uh, Brian Adams um, Mini Masters with the, uh, the trophy award being another one of those, the famous uh, Brian Adams of bobbleheads. Uh, we're about a third of the way there. We need another 20 people. Uh, and so please sign up this week uh, shortly to get this uh, planned. Uh, then coming up next month, we have our very, uh, uh, very anticipated fireside. So at the moment, we have about four firesides for you to attend. 
And again, this is a chance for you to create your own social event, to have uh, Rotary members at your house or at your place of business. Um, just a way to get together and socialize and maintain this strong family of ours. Uh, so on May 7th, uh, the first one coming up, we need at least 10 people here. Uh, these are events that all of you have uh, gotten suggestions for everybody who wanted to attend or to do. So wine and paint night uh, at um, Ashley, um, Ashley Pass Hopkins house. It's $60 to attend this one where we've hired a professional that will include wine and cheese and the potential to create a, at least a thousand dollar piece of art, art of work, work of art. So, um, but we need this one. People sign up for this as soon as possible so we can uh, uh, book the date and put down the deposit. That the $60 each includes the food, the painting, the canvas, um, and your potential. Um, then we're going to have a Larry Stone art night that will be uh, on Tuesday, May 8th. Uh, Larry would like to, to share with us his, his work of art collections. We have a May 11th. Uh, uh, Thursday, we have a wine and music at the James and Lance Victorian Mansion. Uh, that's downtown San Jose. Uh, then on, um, I believe actually the uh, the um, casino night is going to be changed to, I believe, a Saturday, May 19th. It'll be um, an afternoon, like from 3, three to 4. Uh, I'm sorry, from two, 2 to 5 at the Gordon House in the, um, at the Gordon House, the uh, History San Jose. And so anybody else who wants to uh, attend or create their own fireside? Any time in the month of May that's convenient for you, just let me know. And uh, please, I have a sign-up sheet out there, and you'll also be able to sign up online, watch your Rotary Bulletin for the information. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. And firesides are a great way to get to know other Rotarians in a more social setting. I hope you can all sign up for one. I'm going to start signing up for as many as I can that week. All right, to talk about the Unhoused Impact Committee, I'd like to welcome its chair, Morris Chubb, come on up here, Morris. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Sal. Um, the Unhoused Income Impact Committee is uh, pretty passionate about helping the, the unhoused. We want them to have easy access to porta potties, dumpsters, and have frequent uh, pickups of their trash, and have the availability of fresh water. Wouldn't you want that if you were unhoused? If they have that, their encampments would be cleaner. There wouldn't be so many sweeps. So we have been advocating with the city to consider doing that. We help build hygiene kits with the Order of Malta and Mike Block's uh, facility in San Jose. And we, we pay for 240 kits every six weeks or so at a cost of $6.25 each. This year, the Order of Malta has produced some 24,000 kits. And we've purchased over 1,500 of those. One of our committee members, Todd Langton, heads up Agape Silicon Valley that every other week distributes these hygiene kits along with food and much more to the unhoused in San Jose. We advocate for the unhoused with Mayor Mahan, the city of San Jose council members, San Jose County supervisors, many of whom are members of this club. And we also sit on advisory boards for both the city and the county, as well as other organizations. Our committee has our meetings every second Friday of each month. And this last year, we've had Matt Mahan twice to talk about how the city is gonna address the unhoused situation. We've also had Cindy Chavez twice. Uh, we've had retired Judge Dick Loftus, who is a member of our club, who is a um, committee member helping with the assisted un outpatient treatment program in Santa Clara County. Our next meeting is not this Friday, but the following. We'll have Brian Greenberg, head of the programs at Life Moves, speak with us. Please consider joining our committee. We'd love your passion and your commitment to better the lives of the unhoused in San Jose. After all, let's love our neighbor. Thank you, Morris. All right, it is the first meeting of the month, which means it is time to raise some money for our endowment and ring the bell. So anyone with some good news to share, please stand up and we'll get the traveling microphone to you. Who's gonna start? Back here, we've got Brian Adams in the back. 
past president, Brian Adams, I might point out. Good afternoon. First of all, I want to say I do have something in common with those wonderful singers from Opera San Jose. Um, their talent brought tears to my eyes. And when I sing, Uh, being someone of my vintage, one of the great blessings in my life is uh, the blessing of being a grandfather. And uh, we have three beautiful grandchildren. And I'm here to ring the bell uh, because we've got one more on the way. Jeffrey and Monique will be having a child in September. So one ring. One ring, okay. A little boy. And. Mr. Kana. Hi, uh, President Sal. Uh, I'm going to ring the bell twice. Um, remember I talked about last time I rang the bell, I talked about going on cruises as a lecturer. And uh, this last one of the two cruises, one of the three cruises, I got to stop for two days in, in Ecuador, Manta, Ecuador. And uh, luck would have it that I have two grandchildren there, Michelle and Rye, and they brought their kids who are my great grandkids. So I spent a day and a half with them. That's a, one, of the, one of the really, uh, great payoffs of being a cruise lecturer. And uh, the second bell is for uh, being a, the, uh, the lecture on a, the cruise ship going through the Panama Canal. Now, how many people have been through the Panama Canal cruise ship? Quite a few. Okay, uh, you know that voice that comes over the PA system and tells you what you're looking at and tells the history and all that sort of thing? I did that for six hours. It was the high point of my career as a historian of Panama. So two None bells. None of this sounds like working. Leslie. President Sal, we had an amazing march, and so I'd like to ring the bell first for Catherine Tompkinson and the fish crew for bringing back Fish Day. I don't think Randy Zekman's in the room, but a bunch of the DGs and other folks involved with ELC are here, and our next chair, Jen Simmons, to ring the bell for ELC. Yeah. The next one, some of you might remember that President Steve last year called Mark McKenna his Rotarian of the Year. And I want you to know this guy, no sophomore slump, no resting on his laurels. He was involved in Fish Day, ELC. Let's throw in the Women in Rotary event as well. So Mark, thank you. Um, I'm gonna do a joint ring for Bill Tro and Jen Simmons not many people know the Borden House was broken into last Friday afternoon and Bill came to the rescue when I gave him a quick call and he tracked down the thief and who was arrested and Jen rallied the troops to get make sure that the Gordon House got secured over the weekend and the glass has since been replaced and we're all good but I just wanted to point out their their role in helping. Is that four? That's four. Let's, let's round it up to five. Okay. And let's just say Brian Vandrier, who's a true volunteer, has just been amazing in helping with all our events. And if I can broaden it to the whole AV team, that would be nice. Okay. <laughs> Got one back here, Sherrod. President Sal, good to see you guys. Uh, I want to ring the bell as a employee of the formerly known SVB, I'd like to ring the bell to the FDIC and to First Citizens Bank. So two bells for me. All right, Jaime. Good to see you. And it's Jay Ross. Hello, President Sal. Um, I want to honor and celebrate the life of my father who recently passed away. And I want to thank everybody who has shown their love and support for me and my family. I want to ring the bell 10 times. Thank you. Just enough for Jen. Okay. I would like to match Leslie's five rings in honor of the staff of uh, Rotary. Leslie, Marie, and Teresa, who were also there on Friday night at the Gordon House and stayed into the wee hours, well, not so wee, but late hours of Friday to make sure everything was secure and 
okay at the Gordon House. Um, and it had to kind of deal with, it's not fun when your secure place is broken into. So thank you all and um, you can ring the bell five times. Okay. Okay, and I think we've got one last one. If we can get a microphone to Dan Pocrano here. I happen to have a magazine here, Bay Area Parent, with a uh, pretty familiar looking location on the front, Dan. Yeah, well, uh, President Sal, that happens to be the Rotary Play Garden. Um, and that's uh, Lo Mateo. He was playing there that day when we took that picture of him. Um, the, uh, the, the reason he's there is uh, my company recently acquired Bay Area Parent Magazine. It's a 40 year old publication. I want to introduce the publisher, Daniel Payomo. Um, thanks for coming today, Daniel. Uh, he, he used to be a, a, a colleague of your fine organization, as, as yeah. you may know, back in the day. And uh, so he's running the magazine. We recently redesigned it. Uh, this is the first issue it's of the new design. It's, uh, it's the 40th anniversary issue. And uh, I had the opportunity to write. He was nice enough to let me write the story. So of course, I wrote it about the Rotary Play Garden and inclusive playgrounds about the expansion. Um, we, we even took some, we snuck a photographer in there and took pictures of the new zip line, which is gonna be incredible. And, um, and we have an exclusive interview with our own Julie Matsushima. So- You're Racking up some rings here, Dan. Yeah, and, uh, but, but I was very careful in my author's bio to say in the first sentence that I was a member of the San Jose Rotary Club. So I hope that gives me a little bit uh, of dispensation, but since it's a since it's a forty year uh, 40th anniversary of the publication, uh, a Bay Area parent, why don't we uh, go four rings? How's that? Okay, that's that great. Thank okay. you, Dan. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for your generosity. We cut a little bit into our speaker's time, but I think it was worth it. I'm going to quickly, before we get Larry Donatoni up here to introduce our speaker, remind you we've got a mixer coming up on the 14th with the Military Care Committee. You can sign up in the lobby. And of course, we have the district conference coming up April 29th. Look for the bulletin for more information on that. It's at the Computer History Museum. It should be a really fun time. If you haven't been there, I really encourage you to go. And now, uh, Larry, can you come up and introduce our speaker? Thank you, Sal. Um, whether on Capitol Hill or on 60 Minutes or in the news commentary or in casual conversations, wherever we turn, it seems like artificial intelligence or AI is part of those conversations. Today's speaker, Maya Ackerman, is an award-winning artificial intelligence expert named 2020 Woman of Influence by the Silicon Valley Business Journal. She is a CEO and founder of Wave AI, which created the world's most advanced generative lyrics assistant, uh, Lyric Studio. Uh, as a th uh, sought after speaker, Dr. Ackerman has been invited to speak at the United Nations, Google, IBM, uh, research, uh, Stanford University, and many other prestigious uh, venues. She earned her PhD from the University of Waterloo, held postdoctoral fellowships at Caltech and UC San Diego. Adding to her many accomplishments, Maya is a computer science engineering professor at Santa Clara University and associate editor of the Journal of of computational creativity. Boy, that's a mouthful. Uh, and, uh, you know, one item that I just learned here this afternoon is that uh, Maya is also one of the newest tenured professors at Santa Clara University. So, congratulations to Maya. <laughs> and how appropriate to have San Jose Opera as part of our program today because uh, Maya is also an opera singer and a music producer. So please join me in extending a San Jose Rotary welcome to Maya.
It's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. It was really amazing also to hear some opera music in the beginning of the program. Really, really fantastic. So um, we're going to talk about, uh, I think this is making sure this is all set up properly mm -hmm. here. Uh, the future of human creativity, essentially, in the age of AI. I'll make sure that we have plenty of time for questions because that's always the most interesting part. So we'll start with a little bit of prehistory. It might feel as though generative AI was born yesterday or perhaps in November of 2022, but it was not. There were systems that were creating music and art and stories dating back to the 1950s. So here is an example of a song made by David Cope out of UC Santa Cruz. It was a system called Experiments Musical Intelligence, AMI for short. And this is in, in the 1980s, what generative AI already sounded like. <laughs> I personally like this song as much as I like some other classical music. This one is made in the style of Vivaldi. In the art world, we had a system called Aaron by Harold Cohen, who was a professor out of UC Santa Cruz. And his system created art before computers made it easy to do that. He had this robot, you can see it here on the left with big arms that instead of painting things on a computer screen actually did that on canvas because the technology to do it easily on a computer screen was really immature at the time and over time harold cohen taught his system aaron not only to draw but also to paint and become more and more innovative in the composition of images and his work was also show showcased in galleries and such so given that we already had pretty interesting generative AI systems for so many decades. How come we never heard of them? And how did we get here? How did generative AI become the, the hottest thing around? So around 2016, companies started slowly getting involved in this area. Up until that point, it was mostly research, actually a really small number of researchers, mostly out of Europe in a field called computational creativity were focusing on making these creative machines and trying to understand their impact in the world, what it could be. And then Google started entering the space. One of the earliest things they did is called Deep Dream, which are those kind of really trippy looking images that are actually related to human hallucinations. And it was formed by a mistake in one of their image recognition systems. That was sort of the origin of Deep Dream. And then Google also had their Google Magenta, which was really focusing on creating music with a machine, but with purely machine learning methods. So it was really more of a kind of technical effort initially. And then IBM Watson, uh, of course, came about. I'm sure you heard about Watson Chef and all the many, many things that IBM was doing around AI and dabbing into generative AI. But what turned out to be most important was actually Microsoft. In 2016, they released a bot onto the internet that lasted for all of 16 hours. Because Microsoft Tay, by interacting with Twitter users, became incredibly racist in a matter of hours. In fact, I became a Holocaust denier. So uh, <laughs> they were not very happy about it, so they pulled it. And so next time around, they were a lot more careful. So instead of risking the Microsoft brand and building things in-house, they became the major funder in OpenAI. In fact, last I checked, they own 75% of OpenAI. And internally, they think about it as, as essentially part of their family. OpenAI, their big accomplishment wasn't so much inventing generative AI. They're really credited with a lot more 
than they ultimately deserve in this whole trajectory. Because what they did is they took research that existed in academia and in order to create these sort of creative brains, machine learning is all about making artificial neurons and connections and essentially making brains from this data. And they put in so much money into it, Microsoft, through sort of their investment, that they were able to create these brains on a scale that wasn't possible before. So it's work done by academics, but then you infuse a lot of funds into it and suddenly you get something with a lot of interesting emergent properties. And so they made GPT-3, which was quite impressive. They made DALI. Uh, I'm sure you all heard of ChatGPT, which is really just GPT-3 with a layer on top of it. And then uh, DALI inspired other groups to make other images, text to image models. And uh, the CEO of, Stave, of Stability AI managed to raise $101 million back in November of 2022 based on modifying someone, else, someone else's open source model that was closely based on, on Dali. So essentially, the CEO of Stability AI made a really, really clever business move. And with this massive investment, ended up bringing a lot of awareness in, uh, about generative AI into the investment community and ultimately into the entire business world, and then ultimately into sort of society at large. This was the last straw in this sequence. So this is how we all ended up here today, caring about this stuff. Usually I would do a demo, but I actually decided to skip it this time because I really want to prioritize questions. If there's time and interest, I'm happy to show you some systems. Everybody probably here heard about ChatGPT. How many people played with it? Okay, so you're all somewhat familiar with it. Who here has seen images made by AI recently? So a little bit of that. If, um, if you're gonna dig more into it, I would highly recommend playing with Midjourney. They have by far the best model. Okay, so I'm gonna, so instead of a demo, I'm gonna quickly talk about a couple of key concepts and then we'll go into Q&A because that's always the most fun. So one of the most interesting aspects in the way that generative AI existed versus how it, how it exists today narrows down to convergence versus divergence. So typically, generative AI was about opening up the space of possibilities, helping a person see what their options are. Imagine you're writing lyrics, writing a song. The initial point might be, how do I even start my song? So the AI can show you many, many different ways you can get started. If you're stuck in the middle, it could show you how you could continue, kind of opening up the space of possibilities for you. That was really the initial advantage of these systems. But what OpenAI decided to do is take more of a convergent approach, meaning that it was trying to use generative AI to try to give us the correct answer. And generative AI is not very good at it. It's, it's inherently by the way that it's built and designed, not really designed to tell you the truth. So the fact that they wrap their generative language models in a chat bot that we then expect to tell us the truth is sort of a fundamental mismatch. So it's not surprising that ChatGPT hallucinates very often because generative AI is designed to explore the space of possibilities, right? And a lot of the problems that we're seeing right now with generative AI boil down, go back to the previous page, boil down to this effort for these chatbots to be the arbitrators of the truth or for or because some people sort of like to view it this way. Another really important idea is around autonomous AI versus co-creativity. So a lot of artists nowadays and musicians and authors are very uncomfortable with this idea that these AI systems are coming in and that they might take over. Autonomous AI is only one thing that we can attempt to do with generative AI. The other direction is to genuinely support human creativity. And the possibilities there are vast. It's really not about giving you a machine, you click a button and it creates the art, the music, the text. That's not you being creative, right? Like if I'm working on a song with another person and they write the whole song, I'm not being creative. But if the person that I'm working with helps me when I'm stuck, teaches me stuff maybe that I'm struggling with, takes turns with me, there are so many ways that another person can help me be creative. And the number of possibilities around how machines can help us be creative are just as vast. So that's a whole part of 
AI that has not been thoroughly explored yet, and I expect industry to get more and more into these co-creative applications as the field matures. So yeah, what interests me most is how can we really use AI to elevate rather than diminish human creativity? This is my field of research. This is the thing I'm most interested in in the whole world. I've been working on it for about 10 years in my startup and uh, as a researcher. And one of the most important aspects, I'm only going to mention one, is this idea of flexibility. We want machines that can step back when we don't need their help and can step in and assist in exactly how we want them to assist when we do want their help. And I believe it's also really important for the person to remain in the driver's seat when they work together with a machine, which is a big problem when you look at how ChatGPT works right now, where we have to sit there and figure out how on earth to communicate with it so that it does what we want it to do. It doesn't have to be like that. We can build machines where we are in control and where the machines adapt to us rather than the other way around. So I really believe that the field, the field right now is very immature and that there's a lot of a lot of good stuff to come because there's a lot of interesting possibilities that have already been explored a little bit in academia, but that have not really entered the business world at scale yet. And finally, the final idea I'm going to share with you is around bias in the collective unconscious. And it's always interesting to think about generative AI as this separate thing from us. You know, there is us versus the machine. But in reality, the only reason that generative AI at this scale is possible is because we have created so much data as humanity. We've never had so much data. And all the generative AI systems do is they take all this information, all of this collective knowledge that we have and build a brain out of it. So really, these machines are a reflection. They are a mirror of humanity. So the fact that they're so creative and that they know so much is because humanity is so creative and humanity knows so much. And when these machines are sexist and racist and discriminatory, it's because they're showing us facets of humanity. Sometimes developers get blamed for this, right? We're like, oh, developers are white men. That must be why we have all the problems. It's, it's actually really, really not true. It's like, <laughs> It really bothers me because that's not the issue. The, the bias is in the data itself. Um, and um, it kind of shows us what we can do better as well, which I find to be quite interesting. All right, I'm gonna stop here because I really wanna make sure that we have time for questions. Thank you so much. Larry, let's start with you. Yes, well, maybe this is an obvious question, but the academic community is freaking out about the possibility of people using this, misusing, if you will, for essays and applications and so forth like that. Yeah. Um... Yes, they're freaking out, of course. I think about like middle school teachers, elementary school teachers who need to teach our kids how to write. I mean, already a whole bunch of kids can't spell because we have spell checkers. So um, I think that one of the biggest challenges is that it was introduced very quickly without any warning to the teacher. So they're really scrambling to figure out how to deal with it. Ultimately, it's gonna be like, it's a pretty good analogy with a calculator. You don't give calculators to little kids when they learn how to add, but eventually we all use calculators. And maybe we don't add as well, you know, maybe by the time somebody's my age, they're not as good at like subtraction or multiplication and division as somebody would have been 50 years ago, but overall we are further ahead. And we're gonna see the same thing with ChatGPT. Overall, things are gonna move forward but there's gonna be a little bit of a price and not an easy transition. Let's head over here. Hi, uh, ooh, sorry, I'm Kent Sessions. Thank you so much for coming today. And I'm just wondering, are, the, are all of the different, you know, to me, it seems like each AI has kind of its own personality. Some things that they're really good at or, or the way that it works is a little bit different, but do you believe, or has it happened yet or will it happen that the AIs could connect to each other. They could start talking to each other rather than looking at all the information that's out on the internet. Um, and kind of what do you what do you imagine the consequences of something like that could be? 
Yeah, AI is speaking with each other. I do think that this is going to be part of the landscape, ultimately, because there, there could be a lot of benefits in having the AIs engage and share knowledge bases and such. One really interesting example out of academia from about seven years ago, you know, the project out of Europe, where um, this female researcher created robots that make music and they would collaborate on the music with each other, not even robots or like kind of virtual entities. And uh, I wanted to hear it. And she said, it's not for you. The music is for each other. These machines are creating music for each other. So it was very interesting. I kind of had trouble wrapping my mind around it and what exactly is it for. But ultimately, I think um, something like that is coming. And uh, it does get me thinking, because you mentioned personality, that does get me thinking about consciousness. It's like. You ask ChatGPT, you know, are you conscious? And it says, no, I'm an AI system, blah, blah, blah. I'm not conscious. But we believe that in humans, consciousness is an emergent property, right? If you have a couple of neurons, it's probably not conscious. By the time you get to our size of brains, they're conscious. So I think long-term, there are pretty wild possibilities. Fernando. Yes, thank you. With As creative as humans are, I'm thinking of the patent office and how they can distinguish an original painting from one created by AI or an original book by compared to AI or any of these music composition like what you examined, uh, you exampled today. How can they tell one from the other? That is such a good question. Um, how can we tell if something is made with AI? There are so many layers to this question. So if something is made completely autonomously, there is some hope. If its creators want it to be detectable, they could put in various signatures embedded in an image or in music. If an autonomous system wants to hide that its content was made by an AI, we could still maybe detect it. There are right now a whole bunch of systems that aim to detect if you wrote something with ChatGPT, and if you used it in a fairly classical way and didn't change a single character, we can maybe detect it. The problem is, once you start entering into this co-creative territory where you're making something together with a machine, I think it's impossible, ultimately, in any sort of cohesive, predictable, reliable way. If you are really creating together with a machine, if it's not secretly the image on the left, if it's really, really co-creativity, where you are creating together with a machine, where your ideas are intermeshed, where you yourself might not even be sure how much you did or how much the machine did, long term you can't detect that and i know that there is ip law right now attempted to get drafted that says oh if the machine contributed negligibly that's okay otherwise it's not that's not going to track that's not going to hold this the test of time in my opinion because it's just too hard to tell when two people contribute to a project it's too hard to tell who did how much and it's the same thing with machines so we're best long term viewing them as tools while putting some reasonable laws in place that protect artists, uh, kind of make sure that we don't make it easy to imitate the style of living people and other, mitigate other harm. But I don't think that we can reasonably imagine that we'll be able to tell what's done together with a machine or not. Karen. <clears throat> that was a fascinating uh, presentation. And I'm really curious to know your opinion um, on this Elon Musk and Wozniak attempt to ban <laughs> AI for six months. And I was just wondering what your thoughts on that was, because it's, you know, why are we, <laughs> anyway, that's. Thank you, thank you for bringing it up. Yeah, okay. it comes up in discussions periodically. Okay, first of all, and this should probably essentially answer the question, Elon Musk is planning to do another company in AI. There's probably lots of business people here. I'm sure you can imagine why a six months halt for him to catch up will be really helpful. <laughs> Um, otherwise, six months is comical. You, you cannot solve these big issues in six months. There is absolutely no way that we'll be able to do anything meaningful to mitigate damage of these issues in six months. Yeah. Mark. Now is that on? Yeah. OK, thanks. Um, so Mark McKenna, so um, my question for you is about the future. Um, and and directions when the internet came out we were very optimistic that it would be a space of freedom and creativity and connection and community it didn't quite work that way 
Um, and when you describe the very history of generative AI, there's this tension between what academics and researchers are doing in their lab to explore and experiment and what happens when financial interests and business become entangled in that. And so I wonder your thoughts about how we can do better with generative AI than we did with the internet and maybe anticipate some of the challenges that are gonna come out of it, given that it's a mirror to us, uh, so that it we have, because it seems like it could be uh, many times much more impactful than the internet in terms of the way it immerses itself in our connections and our human relationships and our societies? That's a really good question. How do we mitigate the damage of generative AI given that greed is so intertwined in our business world? Well, the short answer is that this is bigger than generative AI. Everything we have in our natural resources human you know human resources everything we've had on this planet has been exploited in negative ways hopefully in addition to positive as well so i really don't think that generative ai is going to be an exception um, i've had the honor of being invited into the conversation on the hill to try to help formulate some laws around it so we're going to do our best to try to set some rules and regulations around these companies so that so that they can do good, so the companies can flourish, but without sort of excessive greed. The best example of that is that uh, systems like DALI, the text to image models, encourage people to create art in the style of artists, living and dead. And as a result, there are living artists for whom there are more generated images in their style than actual images that they created, which is severely hurting their livelihoods. Something that was completely unnecessary for these companies to succeed. They're just kind of picking a PR approach that's helpful, something that's gonna help them get noticed and imitating artist style helps them get noticed. So there's decision-making like this. There is thinking like this from both entrepreneurs and investors who are really seeking to go for the biggest opportunity without any concern for the damage that it causes in its wake. It's very upsetting for me as somebody who's devoted my entire life to my entire, my entire adult life, let's say, to generative AI, to watch people sort of so happily tread into territories that are obviously unethical. Um, so I think we need to take the same approach we take anywhere else, put some rules or regulation, try to put really good thoughts so that we're not throwing out the baby with the bathwater. But it's a serious issue and I'm not going to minimize it. Um, and there are doubtlessly going to be some negative consequences along with some really sort of wonderful gifts to humanity. Okay. Charlie, we're going to do your question and then we've got a question from Zoom. So go ahead. Um, in, in pop culture, um, artificial intelligence, Skynet and Terminator and Joshua and the war games um, uh, and a new Netflix series called Mrs. Davis, which is essentially a supreme artificial intelligence versus a nun. Um, it sounds like a wonderful series. Um, artificial intelligence is always the bad guy. It's evil. How do you, why do you think that is? And how do you think that frames how most people view the current uh, advances in artificial intelligence. Yeah, it's interesting that AI is always painted, very often painted as a bad guy in movies. Sort of an interesting creative choice. Maybe because it has no emotions, so in our minds it reminds us of psychopaths and you know human beings who have no feelings. So we fundamentally don't trust entities that don't have emotions, right? How can it how can it take our feelings into account if it doesn't have empathy, if it doesn't have its own emotions? I think I can understand why you know, filmmakers lean in this direction. AI has always been met with fears. If we go back to the 1980s when we had like a machine beat Kasparov in chess, it is about to take over and run the world instead of us, right? And then it beat somebody and go, oh my goodness, that's it, the world is ending. It's every time it's like that. And these fears are understandable and they're consistent, but they're not any more relevant to generative AI than the previous, than the previous waves. 
Okay, so our question from Zoom, which wasn't an AI generated, but user generated, <clears throat> is with uh, fake news and deep fake photos, what kind of a part do you think AI is gonna play in the 2024 presidential election? Wow, wow, that's a big one. I'm sure people are gonna use everything in their disposal to try to, you know, to win the elections or whoever has, you know, stakes in our election, even if they're not part of this country, might try to use every tool. Um, it's a real shame that the internet has been used to spread misinformation. And my best guess would be that things would, are going to get worse to some degree until we figure out how we can limit the misinformation coming out of generative AI or at least spreading really widely. Yeah. Yep. That's Stay gonna be a problem. Okay, our last question right here from Mr. Ginsburg. All right, President Sal, uh, thank you. Wonderful presentation today. I had uh, sort of a technical question, then a more substantive question. Technical question is, because this is reflective of us, and the us is really only those who are online worldwide, what's electronically not included in that, uh, in that, uh, you know, I mean, like our transactions in Africa that are made using phones included in what AI looks at. So, and then the, the uh, substantive question is, what do you, what, what would be three new, three jobs that you think will emerge over the next 10 years as a result of what, what's coming out of AI? Okay, uh, these are fantastic questions. Oh. Okay, so, uh, what, okay, I started thinking about what jobs will emerge. Quick reminder, what was the first part? <laughs> Oh yeah, what's not available, of course, of course, yeah. Uh, so, um, okay, <laughs> when I say all of humanity, thank you for pointing out, it's not all of humanity. First of all, it's mostly the English speaking world, right? When it comes to art and music, it's mostly Western art and music that it's trained on. It's actually an issue that my students and I have become aware of since we were going to start sort of building systems that specifically target artistic styles that are not Western. And just the language barrier. I mean, so many, most people in, in the world don't natively write in English, right? And, and I don't believe that most of the companies bother translating non-English text. So this is heavily biased to begin with, biased to the world that we happen to live in, but that most of the world doesn't. On the other side, maybe that part of the world won't also suffer as many consequences as quickly from this technology if it's if it's less accessible to them so it's a bit of a two-sided coin jobs um this is really going to change how people work not as rapidly and radically as some people imagine like for example some think, some people think you build a musical ai and it's going to come in and replace the entire music industry all of it at once Otherwise, why, why even bother, right? If it doesn't replace an entire industry. Anyways, that's not how it's going to work. It's gonna be very gradual. We're gonna to need to identify very, very specific use cases where generative AI is helpful, where it's better and cheaper than human labor, which is actually a really, really high bar. So far, <laughs> there are very few use cases that have been identified that have really succeeded. The main one is marketing copy. Jasper was the first company that used open AI in this way, and it's been incredibly successful. It's a multi-billion dollar company right now with about a dozen competitors coming out and more and more every day. It's gonna take time, we have time to adapt. But I think by the time we're done, done adapting in a decade or two, we'll have, we'll have some massive shifts. Most likely some jobs will disappear, some jobs will morph. It's gonna have a very, very significant impact on the job market which is again another area where we need to be cognizant because while it will benefit some people, it will equally hurt people in, in a lot of different industries. Thank you so much. I know we could spend another hour asking you questions about that. Thank you. And on your behalf, a uh, donation has been made to History San Jose. So thank you again. Uh, next week, our speaker will be 
Uh, Scott McGrew from NBC Bay Area talking about local media in 2023. That's it for today. I'd like to wish a happy Passover and a happy Easter to all of you who are observing that. And the meeting is adjourned. Thank <laughs> you.